Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Welcome back, everybody. Thank you so much. We have a great conversation today, but first I want to point out that my guests are so knowledgeable and so giving in sharing that today's guest, Nicole Will, is back again to talk about the topic we had originally planned. I got confused and went off on a caring for the caregiver topic, and she rolled with it so well that I didn't even realize we (laughs) technically recorded the wrong topic until we were all done. So she's back to give us even more advice on the dynamic between families and senior living communities and their employees. So welcome back, Nicole. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, It's always fun to visit with you. Hello again. Thank you so much for joining me today. With me is Alexandra Free. She is the author of From Zero to Zen. She is a former caregiver to both of her parents, and she didn't do them at the same time. So she learned a lot, and she's going to share with us today what caregivers need to know when caregiving disrupts their lives. So thanks for joining me, Lex. Thanks for having me, Jen. So let's start with you and your history. You're You first ended up taking care of your father, which is kind of where the book started because like most of us, you had zero clue what to do when you realized he needed help. Yeah, I got, um, I was living in Los Angeles and my, both of my parents were living on the East coast. I got a phone call at 4.33 in the morning um, telling me my dad was in the hospital and that sort of started the whole journey. Um, in my family, up until that point, my experience was always people got old and then they just died. And, you know, so I just I never as an only child, I had never in my wildest dreams had ever even thought like I was going to be someday caring for my parents. I just thought they were going to disappear like everybody else kind of did. And that wasn't the case. So, yeah. Yeah. So your dad, what, what, why was your dad in the hospital? I read the book, but hospital for diverticulitis and, you know, not something that's generally dangerous or anything, but there were some complications and he ultimately wound up staying. He was moved to another hospital, but he ultimately was in the hospital for seven months until he died. So I wasn't actually hands-on caregiver for him, but I was, um, theoretically, I was the point person for him. Um, And that's when I started learning about all the documents you need to have and all the knowledge you should know, because I had none of it. So when I say I was theoretically the point person, I mean, I was the point person, but I wasn't, um, I didn't have a power of attorney. And that's kind of what started the whole uh, snowball of everything else that started going wrong. Because if you don't have the power of attorney, you don't get to have financial say and you don't have, you know, um, legally, you don't have access to some medical information and all that other stuff. And so I, um, yeah, it was an interesting, it was an interesting experience, but in the end, it sort of prepared me for my mother who later on wound up having Alzheimer's. So, I mean, not that it was a good thing and I never would have wished it on my father but um, or myself, but I kind of got a PhD in, you know, the what you need to know before you need to know it kind of stuff. So, and, and that's what brought the book on. I, yeah. I finally, so many people, every time I would have a friend or a family member or somebody would get sick, they're like, oh my God, what am I supposed to do? And finally I was like, you know, I think I'm going to write a book. So, so it's where the should guide people... I wish I had. Oh, yes. Well, I love yeah. talking to caregiver turd creators because mm. unfortunately it's very necessary, but it's, it's kind of heartwarming to be like, not only did you, you, I refer to it as being the captain of my mom's care team. So you're, you were your dad's care captain, mm-hmm. you know, but it's like, it's just nice that 
you know, you're still sharing, you're still caregiving because you're taking care of other people by sharing this book with them and sharing your knowledge here with us today. So you didn't have a power of attorney. Did you have, did you end up getting that or where, where does somebody start when they're in that position well, that you were in? Hopefully, I mean, one of the things that I scream from the mountaintops when I can to anybody that'll listen is I don't care if everybody in your family is absolutely healthy right now, you should start planning. You should get what I say, get your legal ducks in a row. Before anything else, you should have somebody that is the power of attorney for your finances, the power of attorney for your health care decisions, your medical decisions, which is also a health care proxy. Um, and then you should have your will taken care of. And it's not necessarily just about money. Like wills are, do you want to be cremated? Do you want to be buried? Because you will not believe how many people will fight you on that when that time comes. Um, but also, um, like if there's trusts, do you want to be intubated? Do you want to, you know, do not resuscitate? Do you, what do you want to have happen if God forbid the worst case scenario occurs to you? And even if, you know, I have so many people say, oh, who cares? I'll be dead or who cares? I won't even know. Don't do that to your loved ones, because I was in that position where I had family members suing me. I'm an only child. There was nobody else. My father wasn't married. There was nobody else that should have been making these decisions. And I had people fighting me, you know, whether or not to put them on life support and all this other stuff. And so, you know, again, even if somebody doesn't even have a sniffle, once you get to a certain age, like, I mean, my husband and I, we have all this stuff taken care of. We don't have children, but, you know, God forbid something happens, it's too late. So I was in the situation where I didn't have any of that information, but, or any of that documentation, but um, I was the next of kin. I was the only person. So even though they couldn't give me some medical information, which ultimately they wound up kind of giving me anyway, um, I couldn't, I, I was making decisions for my father medically, like, you know, do I want him to go on dialysis? You know, do I want him to get, uh, antibiotics? Um, which interestingly enough, antibiotics alone could be considered life support. So a lot of people don't know that, but that is actually part of the care where, you know, they don't necessarily just give somebody antibiotics unless you tell them to. But um, what was I saying? I just totally forgot. We were talking about, well, where to start. So what did you do after? So your dad's in the hospital. You don't have this documentation. Oh, you... right. Okay. So what I didn't have. So even though I was able to make some of the more important medical decisions for him, um, my father, he was in the hospital your your health insurance people think that you know they're they're covered they've got health insurance and then they're fine but the fact of the matter is is that health insurance my father's health insurance paid 100% for 20 days after 20 days it started paying 80% and then after a whole 100 days um it stopped paying so he didn't leave the hospital you need to leave the hospital and then return for it to reset he never left so my father had millions of dollars worth of bills. I think it was six million. I don't remember. <laughs> just, um, just a small amount. Just a small amount. He had a bed. Like, you know, people are like, how is that possible? He had a bed that he was charged $10,000 a day for that was supposed to rotate and prevent him from getting, um, having a bed yeah. sore. It never rotated. I never saw it rotate once. And yet they still charged $10,000. But um, it's very easy to get millions of dollars worth of, hospital bills if you're not leaving the hospital and i um didn't have the power of attorney over his finances so i couldn't do anything like i couldn't i couldn't take his bills or take his ira and hand it over to the hospital like there was nothing i could do I, my hands were tied and um ultimately i wound up the hospital because they wanted to get paid they um i started talking to medicaid counselors at the hospital so i actually got like a phd in medicaid too and um i was just so smart after all of this but um there was no way to get my father on medicaid because he had 
you know, some savings and he had an IRA account that they couldn't take. And I couldn't sign it over to them in order to get them on medic, get him on Medicaid. So I had to go, they started legal proceedings where I had to go before a judge and declare my father mentally insane, that he was incapable of caring for himself. Um, that actually never happened. My father died a couple of days before the court case or the whatever, before I had to go before the judge. Um, but ultimately that's what could happen. Like if you don't have the right documentation, your hands are tied ultimately. And um, while my father was in the hospital, I started, my parents were divorced, but um, I started noticing that my something that was wrong with my mother, I didn't know what it was at the time. And it turned out to be Alzheimer's. I found out like a year or so later, but um, the instant i just was like there's something wrong with mom that's it let's go i got all of her medical stuff i got all of her you know legal stuff and that's the other thing you know like if you're going to be somebody's caregiver you need to know the medical information too like if they can't if they can't advocate for themselves like you need to know are there food allergies are there medical you know uh met allergies to medicine um there's a whole it's shocking how much you don't know about the people you love until somebody starts asking questions and you're like, uh, you know, I don't know. And um, so I made sure with my mother, because of everything I went through with my father, I made sure that there was every I was dotted and T was crossed. I was I was prepared. I was like, <laughs> all right, bring it on. I know exactly what we're doing. So did she but. she didn't give you any any fuss over because like that's one of the biggest problems is you know we're independent adults it's like you know you don't i don't need to discuss with you everything that i'm taking or not taking or whatever like i forget that my husband's on blood thinners most of the time because it's not part of my daily routine right. i don't need to worry about it but it's important for to know if he ended up in the hospital especially because we're changing healthcare providers i don't know what happens to our quote-unquote digital healthcare files I guess i'll find out mm -hmm. um but she didn't give you any fuss no um well interestingly enough besides the alzheimer's my mother was on no medication well that's not true she was on one thing she had thyroid medication but after other than that so every time like you know we go to another doctor or she was from you know going like bouncing around assisted living facilities and stuff they'd always be like oh she's on nothing i'm like one pill that's it because I know by that time, most people are on like 16, 17 different things. Like my dad was on 32 pills. Oof. Um, thought my dad yeah, was bad at like 26. Yeah. I mean, it's crazy. I no, she was on nothing. But what was interesting was by the time my mother was diagnosed, um, she was already moderate to severe, which isn't uncommon. A lot of people are already in if you're going by the stages like stage four stage five because a lot of these you know a lot of the times you can kind of hide it for a while or people just you don't know what you're looking at until you know so you know sometimes you're just like oh they're just being silly and my mom was already like the absent-minded professor you know she'd have her <laughs> glasses on her head she'd have another pair of glasses around her neck and then she's looking for her glasses I mean like that was always my mom so I, you know, I would just kind of disregard stuff um, like, ugh, whatever, that's just mom being mom or, you know, but, um, you know, of course, once you actually realize there's something wrong, then you start going back and being like, oh my God, that's right. Oh, and that Christmas and oh God, when she said like, then suddenly, you know what you're looking at, but w there was no history in my family of Alzheimer's. So I really had no Clue. And initially, actually, I thought um, I had hoped that my mother's condition was her thyroid medication was off because that could happen. It's okay. unlikely, but, you know, so I was hoping that, you know, it was something that could be adjusted. I, I Alzheimer's was literally the last thing on my mind, be, you know, because nobody had it. And um, and my mom was such a genius so she was still dazzling you with like quantum physics and all this other stuff. And then yet, you know, 
can't find her classes. <laughs> well, I mean, that was mom stuff, but like there was, you know, like stuff in her refrigerator started going bad or she started collecting in my mother's case, you know, I know some people, they start hoarding weird things. My mother was hoarding like toilets and um, which sounds crazy, but we had toilets all over the house um, and like horribles like she was renovating and she did do some renovations so again I was excusing it like oh that's just she went to Home Depot and bought a thousand things and she'll return it at some point but you know when I eventually moved my mom out of the house the basement looked like it could have been the warehouse for Home Depot there was so much stuff and toilets like toilets who collects toilets my mom and they're not mom. cheap either no, and they're not small. Like my mother, my I'm five five. My mother was six feet tall. So yes, she was bigger than me. But I mean, a toilet's pretty heavy. Like how she got a toilet in from the I'll never know. I wasn't there. And then she was hiding them around the house. I mean, it, and again, like initially I didn't see them, but the first time I saw a toilet in the dining room, I suddenly started noticing toilets everywhere, and I was like what's with the toilets uh, you know again then all of a sudden you're like all right there's something wrong this mom mom's not okay <laughs> but yeah i would think hoarding toilets is definitely a good sign that's yeah. the first but again you know you make excuses like oh she's renovating the bathroom which she did do but again like you know most bathrooms just have one toilet you don't need five but yeah. No, it's no, you don't need a communal bathroom. No. <laughs> Certainly don't need one in a dining room. I'll tell you that. But yeah, uh, I suffer from tiny bladder, but I can make it from the dining room to the bathroom generally fine. <laughs> so, <laughs> I don't need to share my eating and other stuff. No. no yeah, no, no, no. no. <laughs> well, they weren't hooked up, obviously. I mean, they no, were just but... sitting there. And then there was stuff on top of it. So you couldn't really tell. Until suddenly again, like you're like, this that pile of books looks an awful lot like a toilet shape. So they weren't in the boxes? No, they were That's toilets. So, that is so like funny. you could sit on them. <laughs> they just didn't flush. I didn't sit on. Yeah, exactly. Anyway. That, that is funny. But Am so I... when my mom, so by the time my mom got diagnosed, back to the question of she didn't fight me on stuff. Um I had literally just gone through everything with my father. And even though my mother had Alzheimer's at that point, she, it was still very fresh, you know, like hell I had gone through with my father. So, you know, when I started taking her to the lawyers and everything else, I was just doing it under the guise of, I just want to make sure that you're taken care of if God forbid anything like what happened to dad ever happens to you. So she was under the impression and I was trying to protect her and take care of her, but she was under the impression the way I was presenting it to her was that I was doing this so that way in the future, if God forbid something ever happened to her, we would be okay. In my mind, I was like, we got to get all this done really quick because, you know, I knew that if it went too long, I mean, she wouldn't have been, I don't think a lawyer in their right mind would be like, yeah, okay, she's, she's fine, <laughs> you know, so. Yeah, it, I've talked it, to elder law attorneys about dealing with family, like in your situation where like husband, wife, maybe adult kids come, like, how do you, how do you determine that? they're fine or they're not fine or whatever. And it, it was a very interesting conversation. People can go listen to those episodes. They're pretty, pretty easy to find the ones with the lawyers, <laughs> but yeah, it's you, the way you worded it probably helped a lot. Yeah. And that's kind of a, it's kind of a hint or a clue, a suggestion for the listeners is that, you know, it's, it's a touchy subject because of the way our culture is. And, you know, as independent adults, we don't want to, you know, we don't want to give up our independence you know, and I think we also don't necessarily want to take over somebody's life, but it does end up happening. Mm -hmm. So I think you worded that really well. And thankfully, because if you can imagine, I know people that have fought with family members for years. I, um, there was a gal in my support group who was taking care of her mom and her mom would not, would not allow her any access to the finances. And it caused all kinds of issues. And she had 
her mom had a home in Oakland, California, and the daughter had a home in the in the suburbs. And finances were a problem. I'm like, sell mom's house, and she's like, I can't. And I'm like, oh my god, I don't yeah. I don't know what happened because COVID happened, and the support group kind of we went online, and a lot of people stopped showing up. So just a great mystery but yeah you know sometimes family members just will not cooperate with that stuff and it just it, you caregivers end up in a similar place to where you are with your dad they're just really stuck now she never pulled the trigger on going to court and having her mom declared incompetent i don't think i don't think she could i don't think mentally the daughter could handle that and i i never had to deal with that i think that would be really hard oh but i guess God. that is one one option probably would have yeah. been a better option it yeah i remember the day that i talked to the medicaid counselor about that and that that was what i was going to have to do and uh she set it up she set up the appointment i remember walking to my car and i could just feel it bubbling up like i was like don't cry in the hospital don't break down in the hospital not that you know that's i think a hospital is one of those places where it's perfectly fine to have a nervous breakdown because everybody understands like you're not there to have fun unless of course you know somebody just had a baby for the most part people go to the hospital and not so great things are going on so it probably would have been okay but in my mind i was like just don't hold it together get wait till you get into the car hold it together and i couldn't open the door it was a rental car and uh because i was still technically living in california so i would fly home every week or every other week and you know i'd rent a car or whatever and i couldn't get into the car door and that was what pushed me over the edge and i melted sobbing i was just sobbing in the parking lot i was like oh my god everything else i'm going through like now you're making me like go to court to get custody of my father i was like this is horrible and um yeah i mean it is something it is an option for people who don't know what to do it is an option and then the other option that i offer to people which you know might sound kind of cruel but you know i think everybody knows their parent to some extent even if they don't have a great relationship with them they kind of know you know how they tick what makes them work what triggers them what doesn't trigger them and i'm a big fan of, you know, the art of manipulation with the best intentions. But, you know, like with my mother, I knew if I did this, she would react this way. And so I used, you know, what I knew about my mom and how she would react to things. And I used that as a way to like help myself. Like I knew that like when my mom, when I was trying to sell my mom's house and she would, um, you know, if I was dumping broken things into the dumpster, she would go dumpster diving after them because she was like, this is my stuff. You know, it's, you're not, I'm, you're not taking my stuff. And, but like, I knew somewhere in there, my mom was still there. So, and my mom was always the person who, if, if something was wrong, like I couldn't solve a math problem when I was growing up or old, like, you know, as I got older, if I was having an issue, my mother loved to solve problems. And, um, and she was good at it, you know? So what I was, what I started doing was, you know, I would be like, oh God, you know, I've got all this stuff and I would make it into a problem and have my mom think that she was solving it, you know? Whereas, so I would manipulate the situation to get the result I wanted, which was, I'm going to grab all your junk and I'm going to throw it in the dumpster, you know? But when my mom, when it suddenly became my mom's idea, like, oh, well, this ashtray, there's two pieces. It doesn't go together anymore. Maybe we should throw that out. I'm like, oh my God, that's such a great idea. I'd never even thought about it. So when it wasn't me forcing my will on her and it was actually her trying to, you know, solve my problem. And I find that in some cases, you know, like if you're having problems getting your parents to talk about things, like money, for instance, you know, if you go to them, like I'm having money issues, I'm having a problem. I don't know what to do about this. Sometimes if you have that kind of relationship with your parents, sometimes by having them think that they're helping you, they're actually giving you information. And it is, you also have to be a detective. You have to start, you know, piecing together things, 
you know, or causing a distraction and going and looking at the bills, <laughs> you know, but it's, you have to be creative and it's, it's different for everyone and it's different every day. I mean, Alzheimer's is such a cruel disease and it's, you know, very rarely in my experience, at least you get the same day twice, you know, so sometimes you got to pivot. If something works one day, it may not work the next day. You know, you've got to kind of think on your toes and sort of go with what's working for the moment and not hold on to the fact that, oh, well, this worked yesterday, you know, now it's not working. It's like, all right, well, you got to have a bag of tricks. Let's well, especially if it worked yesterday and it's not working today, it's easy to internalize it and think what's wrong with me and right. not, oh, this is just Alzheimer's. And, you know, like, I don't like to do the same thing all the time. So I would think if I, God forbid, ever had Alzheimer's, your bag of tricks would have to be big because you'd have yeah. to cycle through a whole bunch of different things to keep me going keep in the right direction. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Like I like leftovers. Leftovers are fine. I don't reread books. I don't rewatch re TV shows or rarely rewatch movies. I mean, when I tell you I don't do the same thing, I don't do the same thing. I mean, I'll do like the same activities. Like I like to make greeting cards. And so that's the same thing, but it's different. Right. Different and card. So, yeah you know yeah different theme well, whatever different person it's going to so yeah i, I would probably be a big challenge and, <laughs> and i'm super well, let's independent hope, let's hope it never you we know we never need to know this is true that's my plan i take after my dad's side of the family i inherited the fat gene which i can prove <laughs> through photographic evidence and my paternal grandmother lived 203 with her brain pretty pretty well intact wow she'd been uh, mostly blind from glaucoma from 2005 and then she got really super hard of hearing, which is almost like being in uh, solitary confinement in your own brain, which that sounds horrifying to me. Yeah. And, you know, once you get to 102, it's like pff, you, you got to expect things are not going to work quite right. So, yeah, she got to 100. She was fine. Outlived my dad, which is her oldest son. Um, you know, after 100, got to 101, started getting hard of hearing. But, you know, 100 years. She's allowed. Yeah. At 101. Yeah. I know. Yeah. Well, I mean, my grandmother lived to be 93. She passed away in her sleep. Her father lived to be 99, died right before his 100th birthday. <laughs> and the stories I used to hear were that my grandmother's sister, so my great aunt, used to get mad at him because, you know, sometimes he would repeat himself. And I'm like, good Lord, he's yeah. 99. Like he, deser he, he, he deserves to be able to repeat himself. Like, that's fine. But and we um, all do that. Like my husband is really good at telling me like the same antidote this morning, this afternoon, and then like tomorrow I'll hear this. I'm like, dude, you've told me that three times. Oh, I did. And it's not, it's not a cognitive thing. It's a not paying attention thing. Right. Or he wants to yeah. make sure that he's told me. I always try to preface this. Like, I can't remember if I've told you this or not, but right. that way I've covered myself. <laughs> so I think all that's normal aging, but. Yeah, forgetting how to oh, eat yeah. and go to the bathroom. That's not normal aging. So okay. what other PhD did you acquire while taking care of not one, but two parents? Well, um, the difference between all the assisted living facilities or long-term care options. And, um, you know, there's nursing homes, there's, there's rehabs, there's assisted living, there's memory care. Care. Um, and the thing that most people or a lot of people don't realize until they're unfortunately in the situation is that, you know, people are like, oh, I don't really, you know, I'll be fine. I I've got Medicare. Mm -hmm. and it's like Medicare is not going to pay for that. And people don't realize that there is an insurance called long-term care insurance and obviously you need it before you need it and um that will cover your long-term care up to an extent like they'll give you money but i think i tried to get my mom on it i wasn't trying to swindle anybody it was before she had alzheimer or before she was you know declared that she had alzheimer's um but and that's when i was really like okay, there's something wrong here because she was so kind of aggressive towards the nurse. The nurse was like, the only time she's calm is when you're in the room. So can you please sit in the room? 
but don't look at your mother don't you know give her any answers and they started going through the test of the cognitive test and that's when I realized I was like oh damn this there's something going on and then the nurse took me aside and she's like you know I think you really need to get your mother checked out but um that insurance I think was going to pay six thousand dollars a month that I could have used either for care at home. I could have used it any way I wanted. At the end of the day, when my mother was in assisted living, the I think the most her care was, was 8,900. I think it went up to 8,900. Um, so 6,000 wouldn't have covered the whole thing, but it would have covered a nice chunk of it. Yeah. And um, it can, I mean, it can be devastating. I went through, I think, 300. Fifty to four hundred and fifty thousand dollars caring for my mother. Um, I wound up actually going dipping into my own pocket and paying for her before Medicaid like clicked in because unless you're going to go into Medicaid immediately, um, which is we just did that with my mother-in-law. Um, she really she didn't have a home. She was renting. It was very easy to do. Um, my mother had a home and a whole bunch of stuff. And so I knew that I was going to get her on Medicaid, but I was going to do a five year look back period. Um, in California, you guys only have a two and a half year look back period. But basically, oh, that means I didn't know that. that. Yeah, you guys, I, everybody I moved thought it was all five years. No, California is currently California is, I think, two and a half years. But um yeah, you'll be paying out of pocket for all of this stuff if you don't have insurance. So, um, you know, it's just something to think about. But that was that was one of the things that I learned that, um, you know, A, Medicare is not covering any of this and B, it's going to get expensive. And when I was researching for the book, because um, I knew how much, you know, New Jersey, which is where I currently live, I knew how much it was going to cost around here in Connecticut, which is where I grew up because I was looking for places with, for my mother in Connecticut as well. I started just researching like the most expensive places. The most expensive place to have a, a family member in nursing care, nursing home, which is the most care you can get. And that's generally once they have Alzheimer's, they'll go into a nursing home. Um, I think it was something, oh, I can't remember the number now, but it was something ridiculous. I think it's like $450,000 a year. Oof. Jeez. I know. So if you're sick and you live in Alaska, move. <laughs> don't, don't go into a nursing home in Alaska unless you have Medicaid. And then Medicaid will pay for everything. And that was something else I learned. You know, I've, everybody thinks of Medicaid as like, ooh, you know, Medicaid, it's this horrible thing. It's universal health care or whatever. It was such a godsend. Once my mother was on Medicaid, I never saw a bill. And if in fact somebody called asking about, you know, like, oh, there's this bill, I'd be like, oh, I'm sorry, she's on Medicaid. And they'd be like, oh, I'm so sorry. She got awesome care, you know, everything. It was just, it was amazing. And it was such a load off of me, you know? I mean, the stress of worrying about having to pay these bills and was there gonna be some extra cost this month and whatever, I mean, it, it could easily bankrupt you, easily. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think the average is, and it, I'm not sure how they get this average because it it seems awfully low. But the last time I read the statistic was the um, average out of pocket expense for a caregiver is eight hundred fifty dollars a month. And I'm thinking, well, that's like earlier stages because the way we paid for my mom's memory care, you know, she was on Medicare. They didn't have long term care insurance, and I couldn't put her on medicaid because she had a house and we would have had the two and a half or five year look back i thought it was five so you taught me something today it might have been five when when did you when was your when were you um, going through all this? 2017 to 2020 oh no that was probably two and a half okay well it's still she had a house that was paid for in california so right <laughs> i think they would have laughed themselves silly if i had attempted that um and the care home that she was in didn't accept medicaid so i don't remember I don't think the the fee went up much from like years two to three. Well, two, one, let's see. So she moved in in March. They always reevaluated her in March and it was $5,600 when she fell in 2020 and broke her leg. 
and was wheelchair bound and bed bound. And at that point she was really having trouble eating. So she was going to need to be fed. The director of the memory care residence, which was attached to assisted care, uh, assisted living. I mean, um, she was very generous on the evaluation. If, if you were kind of wavering between like, well, is she at a one or is she closer to a three? She'd probably be like a one and a half or two. Um, so after the leg break and everything, it went up to 7,200, which we didn't have to pay because I swear to God, my mother had a moment of clarity. This was uh, March. Well, she died March 31st, 2020. So we all know what was going on then. I think she realized that she couldn't walk. She needed help doing everything. There was this virus thing. She wasn't going to be able to go to the park to watch kids and her rent was getting astronomical already. So pfft, she called it quits, but the way we paid for it. And I, I should actually talk about this more often is like I said, her home was paid for. And, you know, even in California, even if we'd sold it in 2017, we would, they would, we would have made a good profit. We did end up selling it in 2020. So we made even, even more ridiculous profit, but even with my husband being a real estate broker, it took a CPA friend of ours to say, wait a minute, before you sell mom's house and run the risk of running out of money, why don't you rent it out? Which my husband does property management. So he was like, duh. You know? So occasionally you need somebody to point out the obvious to you. So we rented out the house. My dad had had investments. And so the financial planner put in about a thousand to fifteen hundred dollars a month into the to the trust, and she got about sixteen hundred dollars in um, Medicare or Social Security, one of those things. <laughs> and oh, so she was great. covered. So yeah, I, that's fantastic. I thought you were going to say reverse mortgage, and I was going to be like, oh, don't do reverse mortgage. Mm -mm. Reverse mortgage is so sketchy. I know some people, you know have no other choice but it's it's a crap shoot and you're probably going to lose with a it's like betting mortgage. against technically it's betting against the house totally yeah and because they charge you interest on the money that you're borrowing so you're not getting like if your house is worth a million dollars and then you're borrowing against it first there's a fee that you have to pay so let's say now i'm making these numbers up now it's $800,000 that you have. And then every time you use the money, they charge you like an APR. So it's like you're, you're being charged to use your money, you know, and then suddenly you've got a house that now you don't have any money left and you're in a house and now you're going to be thrown out of your house. You're going to go bankrupt. It happens more often than you, you would believe. But I know a lot of people whose parents did that thinking, oh, this is genius and I'll just live my life and everything will be fine and I'll get to stay in my house. And then they lost everything. Now, yeah. sometimes I guess it doesn't work that way, but yeah, it could. You basically so. have to, you're bracing again, you know, you hope they die before you run out of money, which yeah. is what the CPA pointed out to my husband because my mom was 74. And so he's like, you know, even if you sell the house and I mean, they bought it, <laughs> brace yourselves, people. They bought it in June of 1970. Oh my 35, God. $35,500. And they wow. almost didn't go through with it because the interest rate went up at the last minute, which, you know, we've all been dealing with for the last year plus. So, you know, they almost didn't buy that house. I don't know what would have happened. My mom wanted another kid. We needed a bigger house to get the other kid. Lord only knows what, <laughs> what would have been different if they had pulled out of the house, um, but they didn't. So oh, thank God. We sold, so they bought it in June of 1970 for $35,500. We sold it in July of 2020 for $745,000. So even That's in amazing, I know I was like, as it was, I'm like a 50 year old house. Give me a break. Like I felt so bad. It was like, I felt kind of guilty, but it's like, you know, like I'm not going to sell it to them under market just because, you know, that's just not how it works, but no. I did kind of feel a little bit bad, but I had to share it with my sister. So I didn't feel too, too bad, <laughs> but, <laughs> but so three years earlier, probably would have been worth like, I think when my dad died, my husband, you have to have it appraised so that you don't pay capital gains 
on the difference between 35,000 and 745,000. That does not sound like a tax bill I ever want to see. And thankfully no. my husband being in the business first, he was in banking, then he's in real estate. So he, he knew these things. I didn't have to think about these things. And that's one of the challenges of caregiving. And one of the things you kind of address in your book is like, I don't have to, I didn't have to know this stuff. Like I'm a photographer and now a podcaster is like, I know my stuff, but that was not part of my stuff. So he had the property reappraised and I think it was like 600 and something. So the, the capital gains between 35,000 and 600,000 is still ugly. So there's, there's a tip. If, if, your person, <laughs> if a person dies and you own the home, get it appraised. That doesn't cost very much money. It's a whole lot cheaper than what the government's going to do. Well, they're going to help. They're going to hold out their, their big bucket and say, pay up, pay up grieving Give person. Give me my money. <laughs> yeah, for real. Not that they earned it, but whatever. That's a whole, uh, that's a whole other podcast. Not mine. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> so the one thing that you do talk about in the book is learning how to like take care of yourself. We're going to talk about that a little bit more in our new series, but we want to give some tips for the people listening to the full episode. Like, how did you learn how to, man I mean, first you're taking care of your dad and all that stress. And then you didn't even get a breather pretty much before you had no. to deal with your mom. And I work in television and I, most of the shows I, I was freelancing in um, variety TVs, like award shows, TV specials, and 90% of the shows that I was doing were in Los Angeles. So I was traveling a lot. I could work remotely for, you know, if I was on a show for six months, I was working remotely for five of those months, five and a half of those months. And then I'd go out for a week or two before the show. Um, but at one point I was working on a morning show in New York City and I was waking up at 3.30 in the morning Yuck. And um, the way that I realized that self-care was essential for a caregiver was I almost had like a nervous breakdown. I just got to the point where I was constantly freaking out about, you know, the money and this and that. And I wasn't taking care of myself. And I was on the moment, on the days that I wasn't in, like on show at the show, I was, you know, by my mom's side at the assisted living facility, trying to, you know, make her not, I don't know. I mean, you know, they feed her and they, you know, did all that stuff. But I mean, I was constantly like, oh, let's go have I don't know, pizza or let's go to, you know, let's go shopping, like just trying to keep some normalcy in her life. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I was kind of like entertaining her. Um, yeah. And I wasn't taking care of myself and I really was like, I, I wasn't diagnosed as having a nervous breakdown, but I really kind of felt like I was on the verge. And, um, I had been my whole life, like I was into meditating and yoga and eating well. And, you know, I was so all about, you know, spirituality and taking care of myself. And yet at this time in my life, when I was most stressed out, I was relying on caffeine during the day and like, you know, wine or a martini at night, like to just help me cope. And, um, and I crashed. So I finally was just like, all right, enough. And I realized that if I wasn't going to take care of myself, who was going to take care of my mom? Like if I fell apart, that was it. I'm an only child. There was nobody to take care of her. And again, she was at an assisted living facility, but I mean, I was paying the bills. So, yeah. you know, if I'm like, you know, incapable of working and bringing in money, I can't pay for that. But also again, like I was going to visit her like three or four times a week. I was taking her out. I was keeping her you know, sane in the sense of, you know, she was, she was, her Alzheimer's really sort of plateaued at a stage where she was incapable of taking care of herself. And yet she was active enough. She was still wearing suits, like, you know, carrying around her briefcase, thinking she was <laughs> going to work. And she would kind of go 
you know, get cabin fever in the assisted living facility. So I really sort of brought the entertainment. I would take her to movies and, you know, we would do things. And if I was incapable of doing that, God only knows what would have happened. There would have been total chaos at the assisted living facility. But um, so I started doing these little rituals. I, you know, when you're so stressed out and you've got a to-do list that's a mile long, the thought of taking time out to take care of yourself is often like, unthinkable. You're just like, I have too much to do. I'll do it when I'm at the end of my list. And the fact is, is that's exactly when you need to start taking care of yourself more. So I was like, all right, I, I can't sit around and meditate under a tree for an hour. Like I don't have the time for that, but I'll give myself 10 minutes. And so I started these little rituals that I would do in the morning. And then I started doing them throughout the day when I could, like on, I was commuting into the city. So I would sit on the bus and I would meditate. I would take time out to do things like, you know, meditate, even just eating healthy food. Like, again, I was somebody who ate organic food and I knew all about nutrition. And yet, you know, I was eating Snickers bars or, you know, Reese's Pieces or whatever, you know, I could get my hands on because I needed fuel quickly. I didn't have time to cook for myself. And all that sugar was, you know, helping me sort of. I mean, it wasn't in the long run, but at the time, you know, it was keeping me alert. So I just started doing things with intention, like cooking a healthy meal, maybe cooking like roasting a whole chicken so I could eat it throughout the week. But um, yeah, I started all these little rituals that I would do. And I just sat down, I called them my Zen in 10. And I would sit down for 10 minutes every morning with my cup of coffee. And I would just start doing these little rituals. And I started noticing that, you know, it wasn't making my problems go away per se. Like, I mean, my mom was still sick and I still had all these bills, but the stress of all of it wasn't attacking me the same way it was. I mean, there really got, I got to a point where I couldn't get out of bed. Like I was having such panic attacks. And the more I started doing these little rituals, the more I started calming down. And what I realized years later um, was that actually science says, um, Simon says, science says that 10 minutes a day is actually enough for your brain to start reducing the cortisol, which is the stress hormone and calming down your body. And once that started happening, I could start making better decisions about other things. And so it really is, I mean, there's a saying that you can't pour from an empty cup and it's true when you're a caregiver and you're taking care of everybody else, um, you're just constantly giving, but you need to replenish because you can't, you just, it's physically impossible for you to constantly be giving and not, you know, replenishing yourself. It just, you will eventually run out of gas, just yep. like a car, you know? So I think um, the statistic is now, um, it used to be, oh, fudge. You think I could remember the statistic? I think 50% of caregivers pass away before their loved one passes away. I think wow. it used to be 35%. And, you know, my little math brain, which is kind of non-existent, I assumed because more millennials are taking care of loved ones, that that mm. statistic would have gone down, not up, but it went up. And if you're 65 or older, it's even worse. Well, I <clears> so that's... Read yeah, I read somewhere that actually this is the first generation in an extremely long time, the generation coming up. Um, I don't know if that's millennials. It, the, the statistics I was reading weren't using any terms. They were just saying <laughs> that um, people are out now actually living shorter lives. So their parents could potentially outlive them. But there is a, a statistic that 40 to 70% of caregivers um, experience severe stress and depression. And there are currently over 50 million care family caregivers in the United States. And that's, you know, not really taking into account the fact that there are baby boomers that are not being cared for at the moment who are soon going to be cared for. Um, so, I mean, that number is just gonna increase exponentially. And it is, it's just, you know, it's, it's 
it's an epidemic, you know, it really mm -hmm. is. And you, the only way to survive this is to make sure that you're caring for yourself. And people are like, oh, but it's so selfish. It's not selfish. You know, you need to care for yourself in order to care for everybody else. It's kind of like, you know, the airplane thing, you know, put yeah. your mask on first and then start caring, you know, putting them on everybody else. But you do, you just, you have to do it. You have to make time. You have to, and people are like, oh, it's easy for you to say, no, it's not, you know, I, 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 you know, they're like, well, but I have kids. I don't care. Like you still, like, I know you sit down in the morning with a cup of coffee or a cup of tea or something like use that time constructively. Don't go through bills and don't like, you know, I, I don't know, start worrying about what your day is going to bring, you know, like spend that time doing something positive, being, you know, meditating or, I don't know, doing squats. I don't know. Like, <laughs> but, you know, I mean, just you can, you know, the habit stacking of there's always time. Like I always take a bath at night. You know, it's just my kind of way of, you know, zenning out and getting ready for bed. And I used to do it and think about, you know, what went wrong that day or what I'm going to have to do tomorrow that's going to be awful. And I was like, wait a minute, this is a perfect opportunity. I'm sitting in this warm bathtub by myself. Like I could just get centered and meditate and be grateful or whatever. But a little goes a long way. You only need 10 minutes, you know. Well, that's good to know. And that's probably a great place to stop before we Lex and I could talk for hours. We've already done it before. I know. <laughs> so we might have to have her back. Don't even but... get us started. Yeah. Yeah, for real. We get we go on every topic. <laughs> but I want to thank you. And you guys probably gonna want to tune in to the special episodes that are short and to the point. I don't know exactly when those are coming out, but keep an eye on the feed, the podcast feed for those. And be sure to pick up from zero to Zen, especially if you're new to caregiving, because Lex definitely lays out exactly what you need to know, what you need to do. She's holding your hand in this book to make your life a little bit easier, to give you a little Zen in the insanity of caregiving. Well, thank you for having me. You're welcome. It's been a pleasure. <laughs> Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your podcasts.